and stability. Uh, some of the it's Greg Bain speaking. It's a pleasure to be involved in this uh, webinar uh, with regard to scaphalunar instability, which is a, a very important topic at the moment. And I feel as though there's a major change in our understanding of uh, scaphalunar instability. The image on the left is a 4D CT scan, which we've been using in recent times. We find it's a, a new way of getting a better understanding of some of the kinematics of the wrist. And on the right, we can see a, a CT model. Uh, Melanie here, uh, who's initially from Sri Lanka, she's uh, done some work with men's currently doing a PhD at Flinders University. I have some conflicts of interest to de declare. I've provided presentations for the group above. And Fuse Tech is a, 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 a surgical uh, training model company that I've been working with. And I will show some of the concepts that we've been working with them. So recently, uh, Melanie and I published this paper in the Journal of uh, Hand Surgery, and it's basically goes into why some of the scaphalunar ligaments fail uh, with following reconstruction. So I'll go through some of those principles, but I feel as though it's an important uh, uh, bringing together of the concepts of the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So it's something you might find valuable in your practice. So when I think about scaphalunar instability, uh, what I try and do is look at... Um, as in ligament complexes. So uh, if we have a look at here, we've got the dorsal scaphalunar ligament complex. So that's the entire ligament complex on the dorsal aspect of the wrist that stabilizes the whole proximal carpal row. And then you have the volar radiolunate uh, uh, complex and the STT joint complex. So, so what's the real value of this? I think it just brings each area together and makes us realize that uh, you know, fundamentally, there are different groups that are providing stability to the different areas. Now, we know across the dorsal scaphalunate ligament complex that there's the scaphalunate ligament, the dorsal intercarpal uh, ligament, the radio um, lunate ligament. So they're all together, but we just sort of think of it as a complex. And if we need to, we can drill down into the, the finer points of it. But what that means is, you know, we just STT for most patients with scaphalunate stability. This is not a problem. For most patients with scaphalunar instability, this is not a problem. So really, we're talking about dorsal scaphalunar ligament complex. But those more uh, significant injuries where these other aspects are now being involved, clearly they're almost like different subgroups. And so once we start to get involved with these more complex injuries, then we can uh, interface the different complexes and how they relate. So if we look at... Uh, some of these models here, how the scaphoid's moving and the lunate's moving, we can see that everything's in synchrony. As one uh, part of the scaphoid moves, the lunate moves with it. It's all in harmony uh, as we move through the range of motion, whatever the functional activity we're doing. You could say it's even a little bit like these skaters and each bone senses the other bone and it all moves together. It doesn't matter where they go, they're all moving together to be able to do their activities of daily living. So with regard to the ligament complexes of the wrist, I think one of the things that we've got better at understanding is this dor dorsal scaphalunate ligament complex right across the back. So it includes the, the scaphalunate ligament, of course, which we know, and the, the volar and dorsal aspects, but it also includes the dorsal intercarpal ligament. And then a little bit more distal is, is another ligament, basically the triquetral scaphoid ligament, and it creates a band or a belt across the dorsal aspect of the scaphoid and locks it all together. On the other side, interestingly, and if you look at the MRI, you can see this quite clearly, you'll see there's a volar triquetral uh, or scapho triquetral ligament, and that this creates a, a whole big ring that locks it together. And then this capitate and hamate sit in this really like an acetabulum. It's a big acetabulum or crucible that contains the, the distal carpal row. So they all together provide stability for between the proximal row and the distal row. So if we look at the, um, in more detail, you've got the dorsal intercarpal ligament. And interestingly, that spans from the triquetrum all the way across. So we can see that the triquetrum, although it's a bone that we don't tend to talk about much, we know from a sensory point of view, it's important. And Elizabeth Haggett has taught us that. But basically, we've got the dorsal intercarpal ligament, and that spans all the way across the scaphoid and even uh, partly into the distal carpal row. 
and it then goes to the radius as well. So the way that that ligament works, and knowing that this is the sensory input, it enables us to understand how how this whole wrist is working together as a sensory component and the the strong a stronger part on the radial side. So this again is Elizabeth's work. Uh, she referred to the uh, triquetrum as the smart bone, and then also that the um, with all these smart ligaments all radiating out from the triquetrum, whereas on the scaphoid side there may not be as many um, uh, nerve much nerve supply, but it's more important for stability. So why is the triquetrum important? We can see here how it's all linking together with uh, the extrinsic ligaments coming into the, the triquetrum or adjacent to the triquetrum, pisiform pushing on the triquetrum. So the, the triquetrum is almost like the nerve center of the wrist, the ECU sheath, the FCU, the pisiform, everything is moving around the triquetrum. So the triquetrum doesn't matter where our wrist moves or what we do, the triquetrum is picking up what's going on in the carpus. So if we go back to our skaters and we, we know that, that uh, as they go along, they move smoothly and then there can be a, a fall, a significant injury, a disruption of the linkage, a dissociation of the, uh, the proximal carpal row. And we can see that when this occurs with scaphalunate stability, we know that the scaphalunate ligament complex is ruptured but we, it's interesting that the distal carpal row, or particularly the STT joint, tends to remain bound together. And this, uh, despite even complex cases of scaphalin instability. And then the, if we look at on the volar ulnar side, we can see the um, the volar radio, or it's volar luno triquetral aspect in the DAUJ tend to remain intact as, as a bound structure. So while they're bound together, and the dorsal complex is ruptured, each of those con each those blocks of carpal bones are then interfacing across this STT, so the scaphalunar interval. And so each of them is then putting a force, a deforming force on the remainder of the carpus. So if we look here at, the, um, at these models again, so they're not moving as synchronously as they were before. And, and Mr. Bean, who's a... Uh, a great comedian, you know, he demonstrates this quite nicely. If that you're dissociated, you have asynchronous motion. But even if you're dancing with one of the best dancers in the world, as they move along, that loses control and that there's not the stability. So it's not working together. So the scaphoid's going off or the, the lunate's going off in different directions because of dissociation and not having synchronous motion. So Christoph, um, uh, Mathelin taught us a technique many years ago of basically putting um, sutures through the dorsal capsule and plicating this area. And the um, at first we weren't sure about this as a concept, but but what we learned with time was that this was a, a simple technique. It was a technique that uh, that we could all learn. It was a technique that could be done arthroscopically. It didn't need to open up the carpus we didn't end up with a disaster wrist. We didn't end up with a patient who's had complex open surgery, who's got pain, lots of pain or, or other problems. So in fact, what we found was we avoided all the complex complications of wrist surgery and we tightened up the capsule. So for um, if you're using the Geisler or EWAS classification for the grades one, two, and three, we got some stability which helped the patient and changed them from being a symptomatic stability instability to being one where it's not perfectly tight or perfectly locked up, but it was one where it wasn't so unstable and became less problematic for the patient. Now, what all of these other authors and many more have done is take Christoph's concept, and Christoph has done this too, is, is take it so it's not just a small area, but a much wider area and bring in a wider aspect of the DIC and bring it all together in a much wider, bigger expanse. So it's no longer just this small area, but this entire aspect of the dorsal uh, aspect of the wrist. And all of them have taken Christoph's simple concept of doing it arthroscopically with minimally invasive techniques and added to it to try and uh, improve the stability across the, the carpus. So these contributions have enabled us to go away from using big complex open procedures. 
So we were all taught to use the, the, the Mayo open ligament sparing technique. But if we cut down the back of the carpus and we open all this up, it's not a ligament sparing technique. It's actually a, it actually mutilates or uh, compromises the whole ligament complex much more than, than what we thought. So if we go on to some of the other aspects of it, we can, uh, sorry, we're going to go on to, um, I'm going to go on now to uh, how, let's just go past this. So with regard to scaphalunar instability, and we see this synchronous motion of the scaphoid in radial ulnar deviation, what we can see is that as the scaphoid flexes, the, the, sorry, the scaphoid flexes and it brings down the, the lunate with it. And as the lunate extends, it extends the scaphoid. If we look at scaphalunar instability, what we find is the carpus is collapsed. The lunate is the extended, but the, the lunate is not extending the scaphoid. So the scaphoid remains flexed and the arc of motion becomes less. We know the lunate sits in a dissy position but it's not going to flexion. So the total arc of each is reduced, but it's because the other bone is not taking it through to the extreme of motion. The other aspect that's interesting is the scaphoid is unstable. The scaphoid slips over the back of the distal radius and we get the clicking and catching that we are identifying that we know about. The lunate goes into the dissy position. So it's actually tilted across it's actually, um, it's hyperextended, you might say, but it's not like completely unstable. It's just sitting in a position where it's uh, slightly deviated in the same way as if we have a hyperextension of a, of a joint uh, in posterior shoulder instability, it tends to slide a little bit out the back, but without being dislocated. So we know that these uh, STT joint area remains bound, but we have this radio scaphoid instability. We have this diastasis and dissociation. The scaphoid's going out the back and subluxating. So it's really a radio scaphoid instability. And if we look at this example here on the MRI scan, we can see this entire dorsal capsule has been evolved from the scaphoid. It's sitting completely separate almost. And we look at this uh, 4D CT scan, we can see the scaphoid is subluxated over the dorsal rim. Watson taught us a scaphalunar instability test. So all of these things, and what I'm suggesting is that, that the primary instability of scaphalunar instability is radio scaphoid instability. So it's, a, it's the scaphoid that's unstable primarily. With more advanced cases, we then get more instability of the lunate. So what about tendon grafts? Well, um, Donald Trump told us they're generally safe. They go into the same bundle as uh, other medical devices like uh, using um, uh, leech, uh, like using bleachers and other aspects uh, for general medicine. So we can see here in the knee, we know from our knee colleagues that we get all this cyst formation. And we know also in the, in the wrist that we get this abas necrosis. We can see the persistent diastasis. So there really are some concerns with tendon grafts. And this paper that was uh, presented recently at the FESH meeting um, by Jan Ragnar and his, his group, we can see here that most of the patients experience some improvement, but using these 360 grafts, tendon grafts, the results of fixation with the tendon screws did not improve the radiological results and could not prevent the recurrence of deformity. So these techniques are not successful at providing the primary aim of the surgery, which is to bring, bring the carpus back into position. And if we look at some of their statistics, we can see here the reoperation rate is a, a third, complication rate significant. And if we look at this scaphalunate ligament gap, it goes from 3.2 and it follow up at three, scaphalunate angle, almost the same. So I'm not here to criticize this paper. Um, in fact, I'm here to congratulate them because they have gone through their results they're an experienced group they've gone through it in detail and they have defined exactly what's going on with this operation and the, the truth of it is this operation is not actually achieving the fundamental goals of the surgery but more importantly 
it's bringing in these complex problems and complications which for really is just a wrist injury we shouldn't be having these complex problems we should be minimizing them and what they found as well is this necrotic uh, tendon when they opened the surgery they found the tendon was necrotic and that it had not healed to the bone of the scaphoid or the lunate and so i wondered looking at all this what can we learn when we look at anterior cruciate ligament reconstructions because clearly our knee colleagues have been doing this for much longer than us. So if we look at this, uh, this, this is a femur for those who are doing wrist surgery all the time. We can see here that we've got the multiple bundles of the anterior cruciate ligament. It's not one ligament. There are multiple bundles that pass down from the femur and it has a large footprint. It's not like one small area. It's an expanse of a footprint with multiple bundles. And as it goes through the range of motion, each different aspect of the tendon becomes tall. In an extension, it's one bit, then it moves. Like every five or 10 degrees, different parts of those ligaments become functional. And if we look at the instant centers of rotation, we can see that it changes uh, throughout the range of motion. So one position, one position. So it's, it's a moving thing. It's not just a simple hinge. It's a complex hinge with the moving centers of rotation throughout the arc of motion. So this led to some surgeons recommending that, that they knew that, it, it, that the ligament reconstruction must be isometric. Some of the surgeons went to using double bundle techniques. And the other thing that is they delayed the return to sport for at least a year. So I think to do some sort of complex ligament reconstruction and expect them to get back to sport in a few months is just not realistic. So I'm certainly not here to recommend a double bundle um, scaphalunate ligament reconstruction but it is important to learn from our knee colleagues so the other concept is what's called suspension fixation which is an endo button type concept here and what they found with this is there's micro motion of the tendon moving that what's called the bungee cord effect and this leads to this tunnel widening and the other thing that they learned is the tendon only heals the endosteum it's not healed through here the synovial fluid is passing through this gap and it's it's not actually healing to the endosteal bone. So in fact, at time zero, they've got good fixation at the at the uh, the position with interference fit screw, and that with time, it's the periosteum at the opening of the bone where it heals. So endosteal bone does not heal to tendon. The other concept is uh, they have this ligamentization, which is the concept where the the, the tendon over time basically changes into a ligament with changes in the vascularity, the innovation and the collagen type. So all of these things are really a, a partial um, resubstitution of the tendon. And with time, the biomechanical properties do improve, but, but it's, it's a, not a fast process. This is a, a slow process for our anterior cruciate ligament. So if we go to the, the wrist, we uh, all think of the scaphalonic ligament as having a, a small attachment, and, it, and relatively it does. But the dorsal intercarpal ligament and the, uh, the other aspects of the dorsal capsule, it's an extensive footprint. It's not a small footprint. It extends you know, like almost the length of the scaphoid. It, it's much more than we've appreciated. And if we look at the centers of rotation, some work done at our university, we can see that the centers of rotation, it migrates across the scaphoid as it goes through a range of motion. And this is with radio ulnar deviation, this example here. So it's actually moving from point to point to point to point. So if we think we're going to put a drill hole in the scaphoid and that we're going to put a ligament into the middle of it, it's not going to heal. It might heal with the periosteal area, but we're certainly not going to reproduce this extensive area of attachment and reproduce the centers of rotation throughout the arc of motion. It's not surprising that we have failed with our reconstructions. And the concept of the, the rassle screws uh, are, are sort of nice that we can hold it all together and it can be done percutaneously. But really the message is, is that it's the complexity of the motion is too much to expect a single screw to do this. And we're putting this screw in to the soft endosteal bone. So Nick Smith, who's a, a surgeon from Sydney in Australia, this is one of his examples, and uh, he's shown this at the Mayo Clinic to try and help us understand this problem. You can see the lunate has uh, fragmented, 
It's full of granulation tissue and scar tissue. We've got degenerative osteoarthritis and avascular necrosis. Some work that we've done with the osteology of the lunate, we can see that we've got this subchondral bone plate, but this very fine network of the trabecular bone of the lunate is not designed to have um, drill holes in it. This, this bone is very, uh, is, is very fragile, it's very delicate. It's not designed to have drill holes. And if we look at this in a bit more detail, we can see the cortex. The, the cortex uh, it provides uh, like a shell around the bone. So it's possible that we can use that uh, for fixation. And if we look at the endosteal bone, we can see this soft cancellous bone. And this is really very fragile. It's, it's not designed to take load of the bone. And then if we look at this in more detail, the Sharpies fibers that go into the ligament attachments, they don't go in three millimeters or five millimeters. They literally go in well less than one millimeter. So the ligaments attach basically uh, almost like in concrete with uh, cables for a bridge, basically, but in, in a reasonably superficial aspect of the bone. And if we look at the, the vascularity as beautifully demonstrated in these works, we can see that there's this extra articular vascularity uh, with its small, um, small blood vessels. And then if we go to the intraosseous vessels, we can see that they come through uh, through the lunate and also in the scaphoid. And the work by Harry Croc, this is the venous drainage of the lunate. And the blue lines I've put here are a bit of artistic flair from myself. But, but what, what they show is, and what, what Croc taught us, is wherever a, an artery goes into the bone, a vein comes out of the bone. So it's like the perforation of the bone for the artery is where the vein comes out. And so we know that the venous drainage will be compromised if there's an injury at this area as well. So these are the extra capsular vessels. These are the perforations that leads to the intraosseous vascularity of the, of the carpal bones. And we can see that this is the footprint of the dorsal uh, ligament complex on the scaphoid as seen on this, uh, this image of a bone. So we've got the perforations and we've got this ligament attachments the, the perforations of vascularity going through the dorsal aspect. So if we cut this off, the dorsal aspect, the scaphoid, we are disrupting all of this intraosseous vascularity of the scaphoid and of the lunate as well. So Paco Pinal sent me an example of this case here of a patient who had a drilling through the scaphoid, so, so the lunate. If I was drilling through the lunate to put a tendon graft, I think I'd be pretty happy with the position that, that this has gone through because it could easily be more um, distal or it could potentially have more problems. And we put the drill hole through here. And if we look at Lee's work of the intraosseous vascularity and we look at our micro CT and we drill through there, it's not hard to uh, imagine that this entire lunate can become avascular and that it be can become fragmented and develop avascular necrosis. And if we go back to this one at six months, we can see all this bone is white and sclerotic. We can see that this also is more sclerotic than the adjacent radius. And if we look at it now at 24 months, it's all fragmented. So in fact, I think this was avascular way back here, and it may have been avascular on the, uh, the proximal aspect as well. But really, my message is we shouldn't be putting drill holes through the carpal bones of the, of the wrist in the, the knee, you know, it's, it's a bigger bone, it's easier to do, but to try and do this sort of uh, drill hole, I think is just too complicated. And then what about, instead of putting a tendon through, maybe we should just put a suture. So this is a, patient, a paper recently published on the Latigé concept, and this is taking the coracoid process and putting it onto the glenoid, and they put a drill hole through, and this has got a, a suture that passes through with a button to hold the uh, it in position. So in their paper, they show examples of where the bone united. So we can see the coronoid process is clearly united onto the, uh, the glenoid, and we can't see any abnormality here. This bone is good. But when we go to this other example where there's a non-union, we've got this large trench within the glenoid. And what this is telling us is that as the non-union uh, persists, that coronoid, coracoid process is moving a little bit and it's leading to 
this suture that passes through the dorsal aspect of the um, scapula, there's a little bit of mo motion there. And this is leading to fragmentation and disruption of this bone. So this is a complication of just a suture going through the bone. The previous one was a tendon. So if you put a suture through a bone and it's only a suture, you're going to get the same problem. So this is our suture sitting there. And we can see that that's just going to rub backwards and forwards as the patient moves the shoulder. So what about using a polyethylene? So some of our sutures have polyethylene in them. So this is a, a study from a, a couple of year, a few years ago. And we can see here, this is the standard histology. And this is using a... Um, um, a bipolar, not bipolar, a biorefringent uh, lens. We can see the polyethylene sitting within the fragment. And, and we know from our hip, hip surgeons that if you've got polyethylene in the articulation, that the, there's uh, hist histiocytes and giant cells, that they're basically trying to eat and fragment the polyethylene. But the polyethylene is such an artificial substance that it's not able to do this. There's, there's no doubt polyethylene has been a revolution uh, in hip arthroplasty as a as a loading surface, but as a as a material to put into the joint and lead to this sort of problem, I, I think is just not the right sort of material that should be in the joint. And in this study, they demonstrated it was detrimental to the cartilage, the synovium and meniscus, and it led to phagocytosis of particles and optosis and induced osteoarthritis. So polyethylene is not the right material within your suture construct. So if we go back to the uh, the capsule, so we knew before that there's the capsule that invests the wrist. We It has the ligaments, which are thickenings of the capsule. We know about the extra osseous blood supply. We know about how the innovation of the wrist, how this all works together. We also know that with scapholunate ligament tears, that there's often a disruption of the capsule from the bone. And it's almost like a, what I call a sleeve avulsion. So the intrinsic ligaments tear, and then there's a stripping off of the extrinsic ligaments, intrinsic tear, extrinsic ligaments strip off, and we are able to get then the scaphoid is almost like moving around without it being contained by the dorsal capsule ligament attachments. The other thing that's interesting, so within this sleeve, we've got the capsule, the ligaments and the periosteum in the sleeve, the periosteum we know is, is the best healing structure. We know that in fracture healing. And so it's the periosteal capsular layer that we need to respect and try and get that to reattach onto the normal attachment points. The other interesting point is we know that within an articulation, there's often synovitis and a lot of synovial fluid. And the synovitis will tend to adhere onto the avulsed, uh, where the bone's being avulsed or the ligament's avulsed and the synovium will sit in that, that interval, we need to debride that synovium, otherwise these tissues are not going to heal. So this is at an arthroscopy where we can see that uh, we've, this is the scaphoid and the capitate. This is the dorsal intercarpal ligament for a patient of scaphoid instability. With a probe, I'm able to palpate and identify that the dorsal intercarpal ligament has peeled off the scaphoid in this entire area we're able to debride the granulation tissue. We're able to debride the synovitis so that we can see the entire aspect of the dorsal scaphoid. And in fact, here we can see all this synovitis. It's this sludgy sort of stuff. It needs to be removed to enable the tissues to heal. So I actually went through this slide before. Uh, so we've talked about Christoph's work, how it's important as a minimally invasive technique and how these other techniques are bringing more capsular tissue together to stabilize across the dorsal scaphoid. I'd like to acknowledge the concept that's developed by uh, Riccardo Lucchetti and more recently by Scott Wolf of creating windows. So these windows are small uh, exposures or small openings to the dorsal aspect of the carpus and then enable us to identify the scaphoid lunate or triquetrum and then to perform our ligament repair. So I think this is an important aspect. So. In an ideal world, we'd do it all arthroscopically. But if we are not able to do that for whatever reason, I think we can use small windows to enable us to get through to the ideal position. Now, there's some cases where we probably need to go open. This patient presented to me at 25-year-old, had a motorbike accident, and 
after his motorbike accident, he had uh, open surgery done at another institution, was sent to myself afterwards because uh, it hadn't been reduced and uh, it needed to have further surgery. We opened up the wound and we could identify this whole dorsal capsule had been pulled off the dorsal aspect of the scaphoid and the lunar. You can see here how this is all completely released. Some of this may be related to the surgical exposure, but quite a lot of all this here is related to the complex initial injury. So what we did with this case is we put uh, grasping sutures into this dorsal ligament complex, and we put a, a suture anchor in there, and we pulled everything down onto this suture anchor to tighten this whole dorsal aspect of the scaphalunar interval. So we've got one suture anchor in position holding it there, and this is the, the final position we obtained with just one suture anchor. Now, my, my point here is with this cortical fixation, we've got a drill hole in the bone, but it's really, it's the cortical fixation that's holding it, that we've been able to stabilize this whole uh, proximal carpal row and the carpus with by just taking this capsule of tissues and advancing them and putting them back to their attachment on the scaphoid. You'll also notice it's not to the dorsal scaphalunate ligament attachments, but it's more to the radial side, trying to respect that footprint concept that we had before. So in fact, the idea that I like to do is take it more radial, and then as it's pulled across, a bit like a tension band, is then it can attach and heal along that entire footprint, not just the area where the scaphalunate ligament is, but the entire footprint including all the area of the DIC. So this, this is old work for us. And at that time, we were using uh, transosseous tendons. But the point that I wanted to make here was the attachments of the, the suture anchors. So in fact, in this case, with this um, kinematic study that we've done, we identified the uh, isometric points. And if we put a drill hole into uh, the lunate here and put a, a suture anchor in, we need to go fairly radial to be able to make sure that we get an isometric stabilization of this complex. But as you know, as I said before, as we move through the range of motion, the isometric point for the scaphoid actually changes. And we talked about the windows as well. So we like to use what I call the docking technique of this so that as one anchor, we put sutures from one anchor to the other anchor. And so that as we tighten that up and bring it together, each anchor is brought together and holding together the scaphoid and the lunate. So in this concept here, we'll put a suture anchor into each of the bones, into the scaphoid and the lunate. And as we tighten them up, we bring together the scaphoid and the lunate. And an interesting concept, of course, is the ligament attachments. If we shorten the distance between the ligament attachments, then by definition, it must reduce the articulation because a normal ligament will span from one suture anchor to the other. So by shortening this interval, it enables us to close that entire, entire articulation down. So the docking of the ligaments and attachments, I think is an important one. So this is one of our cases using this initial technique. We can see that uh, he's got a good range of motion. We've been able to reduce the articulation and be able to get a, a functional, uh, functional wrist. Now, with this technique, we were generally pretty happy with the results of this, but what, what we did find is that some of these suture anchors with time opened up. So when we got them early, we were able to reduce it, but later on, some of them opened it. So this can only occur if this suture ruptures or if the suture slips through this suture anchor. Now, um, Homer Homer's a pretty smart guy, but what we've got here is the articulations of the wrist and the innovation. And Elizabeth Haggart taught us about the importance of the innovation of the carpus and that how if you denovate certain aspects of the wrist, you lose your neuromuscular control. So you denovate that part of the wrist and the, the tendons and the, the tendons that come in to support and stabilize the wrist become ineffective. So you lose that uh, feedback. So as Homer would say, can you cut my nerves so I won't know when I re-injure myself. So the idea of cutting the nerves almost as to try and prevent the pain then leads to the fact that the patient can't rehabilitate and protect themselves. So it's important, I think, that particularly in surgery where we're aiming to stabilize the carpus, 
that we do not do a de-innovation because that will only lead to problems. There may be a place to use a de-innovation for a patient who has a lot of pain, despite say having a wrist fusion, but I think to do it where we want to do reconstruction and we want the patient to get back to functional activities, I think we should avoid it. So I'm going to go on now and just talk finally about uh, the wrist models that we've been using for surgical training. And this is one of the wrist models here we can see, and I, I declared before I have a conflict of interest with this company, Fuse Tech from Adelaide. But from the imaging point of view, this is an X-ray of the model. This is a 3D CT scan of the model. And being a wrist guy, we've worked very hard to make sure the ligaments are all in the right place. And so we're able to use these models to help us understand the kinematics of the wrist, but also for surgical training uh, in our, our cases. So this is uh, in, in the dry lab that's been created in Adelaide. And so we've got a diagnostic wrist arthroscopy in the model. So we can see here, we've got the distal radius. And as we go further, because we're talking about scaphoid and stability, we can see the scaphoid on the left and the lunate on the right. We've got a drive-through sign and we're now going into the mid-carpal joint across the, towards the triquetrum. And so we're able to use uh, these models uh, as a diagnostic arthroscopy for education, for teaching of the younger doctors. But what we've enjoyed most of all is to be able to practice and get better at some of the more advanced techniques. So we've talked about Mathlin's technique. We can pass needles through the dorsal aspect here and grasp them to be able to to get a, a better stabilization of the, the carpus and also the triangular fibro cartilage if we use, wish as well, as well. So we're able to use this uh, in this case for uh, uh, practicing how to do arthroscopic stabilization of distal radius fractures, you can see there. We can advance this into position. We can then use uh, just a drill which <laughs> bought from the hardware store to be able to advance this into position so that we can practice the concepts of being able to stabilize distal radius fractures arthroscopically. We can also see using it for um, assessment of the triangular fibro cartilage and TFC repairs. And then interestingly, even the sigmoid notch, we can see the sigmoid notch here, the ulna and the TFC. So to be honest with you, I was quite surprised how accurate this all was that we're able to see the details of the anatomy to help us get a better understanding of the anatomy, but also to help practice learning techniques. And this is a scaphoid fracture in the mid-carpal joint. So this is one of the models uh, that we're able to, to use. We can see that it's basically got different aspects of it. We've got the tendons and the nerves within the, within the model, and that can then attach to the entire arm and the shoulder as well. We're able to uh, practice uh, making sure that we get our surgical approaches right. And it, it's not really perfect from an anatomical point of view, but it's more a bit like a cartoon where all of the structures are there. So you've got pronata quadratus and the artery and the median nerve. So it's all there, but we don't have all the, the detailed fascial layers and the fat, which is probably not that important for, for the exact teaching of it. So, But it does help understand how to um, do the fundamentals of the exposure and how to stabilize the distal radius. So this one, they've all got, these ones have got a fracture of the distal radius as I showed before. So it's got a periostom and we can open that up to make it a displaced fracture or we can leave it as an undisplaced fracture. So we can see the fracture here uh, of, the, of the distal radius. And this enables us to open this up. We can see we've got a, a lamina spreader in here. We've got KYs all over the place in the plate. And then uh, we've got the fluoroscopy of the, the surgery. So the one of our trainees is able to practice the technique, learn the fundamentals of it, and then put the, and use it with the fluoroscopy unit within the dry lab. So in conclusion, scaphalunate instability uh, is an important topic. I think that we've had some significant advances in our understanding of scaphalunate instability in the carpus. I think it is important that we stabilize, particularly that dorsal aspect of the scaphoid or scaphalin interval to be able to get the best outcome for our patients. Thank you very much. So if you're able to, can you hear me now? 
So the question I, I have here is the patient has a distal radius fracture and a disruption of the scapular interval. This, this is a, a good question. If the patient, so what I do is once the fracture has been reduced and stabilized, I then assess it under fluoroscopic control. Uh, and if it's, if it's mainly closed down, then I probably don't do anything because we know from Tommy Lindau and others that the majority of patients with a scapholunar injury with distal radius fractures do okay. But if it's a, a younger patient, higher demand, uh, and it's a, a really quite an obvious diastasis, then I would uh, do an arthroscopy. Uh, you would use that partly uh, to be able to assess the fracture, make sure I've got a good reduction. And then if it's a, a minor case, in fact, for most of these where I've reduced the radius, it does help reduce the scapular interval. So I think most of those can actually be managed with a Christoph's technique or a modification of that where we're bringing down uh, the proximal carpal row. So we don't have to get so excited about it, but if it's a complex perilunate with the radius, then uh, we need to be looking at uh, more advanced techniques to stabilize it. So um, the uh, Geisler classification was developed in about two, uh, 1994 and it had the four aspects of it. The EWAS classification adds to it, particularly in the mid-carpal joint where we've got the probe defining whether it's volar, dorsal or both volar and dorsal. So I think the EWAS does add to it. So I think we should use that EWAS modification to help us understand um the effect of the uh of it, whether it's a volar or dorsal uh, aspect instability so the most common procedures so for the patient who has um a grade two or three then i would tend to manage this with uh, an arthroscopic technique such as uh, Christoph's described. If it becomes more advanced and it's opening up, then I tend to use uh, a window technique, which is where I may put a window on the ulnar side here or on the radial side of the proximal carpal row. And what we've tended to do is put sutures into the triquetrum uh, and then bring it right across to the scaphoid, deep to the extensor tendons, and put a, a suture anchor onto the scaphoid and, and try and use like a belt and bring this whole thing together. Now I must point out that a number of other surgeons, as, as I mentioned before, are doing a lot of that arthroscopically. And I think that's where it will continue to go. If the patient has degenerative changes or the carpus can't re be reduced, then I would tend to go onto a motion preserving procedure such as a, a, a limited wrist fusion, like we would use a three corner fusion or a proximal row carpectomy. So I'm, I'm tending, I've gone away completely from passing tendons through the bone, and I don't tend to do any transosseous uh, K wires or sutures. So I think we moved away from all of those. Well done. So thank you very much. So I'm sorry I can't hear you, but um, I hope that that's been of some value and uh, I, I look forward to catching up with the guys there at some point in the future. And uh, I hope you like the idea of the models as well. So that's something new we've been doing. So we look forward to catching up with you at another time. Thank you for having me involved with your uh, webinar.